Hey everybody, my name is Matt. Uh, welcome to Parkside at Home. I'm Callie. Uh, so excited that you're joining us here today, whether it's your first time or you've been watching since the beginning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Very excited that you're joining us. And I want to remind you that we would always love for you to join us here in person at the Sterling Community Center on Sunday mornings, 1030. We're here every week and we'd love to have you. Because as great as this <laughs> is in terms of building community and relationships, uh, it's just not the same being in, the per in person, yeah, right? Absolutely. And we are all about inspiring bridge builders to live and live love like Jesus. So in that even, we understand that life can be a lot sometimes. Uh, the weight to carry, be it parenting or, or finances or sickness, whatever it is that's going on in your life, it can just be a lot. And part of the whole reason why we're here is to help you have an opportunity to know what it is to live a life uh, like Jesus who can carry that weight for us. No matter what is going on in your life and in this season, we want to be there for you and with you. And so we would love to get to know you and connect with you. So feel free to message us and, and comment on this video. And you can always go to our website, parkside.life, uh, to just ask for help and to just get to know us more and that way we can be a part of community together. Yeah, and we encourage you during the message to really lean into what it is that God is saying to you. Ask yourself those questions. Think about what's being said, the scriptures that you're hearing so that, again, we can help be in this community together to know what it is that God has for us on a day-to-day -day basis and what it is that he may be teaching you through today's message. And really, it's because of you and your partnership with us, be it watching here on Parkside at home or helping us out with some of our events or giving that we're able to do everything that we do and lean into the vision and mission of Parkside and do what it is that God's asking us to do here in the Sterling community. So thank you so much for all the ways that you've partnered with us. If you'd like to worship through giving, you can go to parkside.life slash give. This is a safe and secure way for you to partner with God and with us in helping us build bridges between people and Jesus. Yeah, we've already mentioned it a couple times, but really the gospel changes everything. And that's the series that we're in right now. So again, as you're listening, as you're hearing what it is that God has for you, think about how can the gospel change my life and let us know how that is. Yeah, we would love to get to connect, to connect with you guys, like Matt said, and we would just love it if you would comment, message, like the video, even share it if it meant something to you. Yeah, thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you soon. I am really excited to be together this morning as we kind of continue on in this conversation about Easter. And, and I think it makes me sad that we have done such a bad job of, like, really understanding what, like, not just the Easter season, but like any church season like really means, right? Like we have all this build up to, to Easter Sunday and it's like, you know, we see Easter candy coming out like before they've even like pulled all of the Valentine's Day stuff off the shelf, which is great if you love certain things like um, not the Cadbury cream eggs, but like the chocolate ones. Like I love those. Those are good. The dark chocolate ones are awesome. But like you can buy those before you've even finished off your like Valentine's Day candy. Welcome to consumerism at its finest. This is the world that we live in. And so like we have all of this build up to like this one day being Easter. And then it's like, okay, Easter's over. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like the reality is we celebrate Easter, we celebrate Res Resurrection Sunday, but like Jason said, like it's every Sunday that we celebrate this because the resurrection happened once because Jesus rose from the dead, but we can celebrate that every day because our sins are forgiven. We have been set free. Like that's something worth celebrating, not just on Sundays, not just on Easter Sunday, but every single day of the week. And yet our, our posture sometimes is, okay, well, Easter's over, what's the next thing? What is the next thing? Mother's Day? Is that what they're pushing on us now? Okay, great, fun. So I'm sure like by the time they had all of the like Easter stuff in Walmart and Target moved over to the clearance section, you know, like they had like, buy your mom this thing because this is what she needs and wants. She doesn't, she do whatever it is, she doesn't need it or want it. Just give her a nice card. Tell her that you love her. Tell her that you appreciate her like, and mean it. That's what you should do for your mom. So that was a side note. That had nothing to do with whatever we're talking about this morning. But anyhow, the, the truth of the matter is the point that I'm trying to make here is that Sunday morning, that, that 
Easter morning, that resurrection morning was just the beginning. It was the beginning. And there are a lot of pieces in between that we don't have a lot of details for, right? It was like, why last week, I, I wanted to try to give us some sort of broader context of what Mary might have experienced when she went to the tomb and realized that Jesus' body was gone. Like, can you imagine, like, if you, you lost someone very near and dear to your life and you went to do something before they were buried or, like, in this, this process, you know, like, what we do now is different than what they did back then. Like, we do, like, a visitation sometimes. Can you imagine, like, going to the visitation, like, going to the funeral home to be there for the visitation and the people there being like, yeah, we don't know where they went. I'm, I'm sorry, you lost a dead body? How does that happen? Like, this is kind of the context that Mary was walking in that morning. What do you mean he's gone? And then Jesus appears to her and like, I, I can't even begin to imagine the emotions. Shock, disbelief, excitement, like, and, and probably some doubt played into that, right? Like I talked about that last week. Like if I were Mary, I would be thinking, oh good, I'm going crazy because I'm seeing a dead person. And what Jesus says to her is, I'm not dead. I'm back. Like, that is so exciting to me. I can't even, like, wrap my brain around how she would have felt. But we know what she did, right? There's a few pieces about this part of our history that we do know about after the resurrection. And again, there's a lot that we don't know, and I wish that we did. But we, we know some things that happened that same day after Jesus looks at Mary and says, hey, Mary, and she realizes it's him. So picking up a little bit where we left off last week is what I want to do this morning. And she had gone to the disciples to tell them that she had seen Jesus. And in Mark chapter 16, it says this, early on the first day of the week after he had risen, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven out seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping. Now, we have to remember, like, the disciples had scattered, right? The disciples had scattered. Judas had gone and made different decisions. Peter had denied Jesus. And, and they came back together. And so Mary goes to them where they are. They're all gathered together. They're overcome with grief. They don't understand what's happening. They've spent three years with Jesus. He's telling them who he is. He's telling them he's the Messiah. And now he's been killed and he's dead, and they don't understand what's happening, even though he tried on multiple occasions to explain it to them. And it says, Yet when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe it. Which is understandable. I'm not standing up here this morning judging them for that at all, right? I think if any of us were in that situation, we probably would have said, yeah, Mary, we, like, you've got a lot going on. Like, your, your grief is getting to you, sister. Like, you, like, maybe you should go take a nap. Like, maybe, like, do you need something to eat? Like, let's, like, it, you're seeing things. He's not, he's gone. It's understandable, right? Like, I don't think anyone would judge them for that response. But throughout the Gospels, we get to pick up bits and pieces of what Jesus did. And it's so much fun to walk through. In, in John chapter 20, it gives us some more of this story of what happens next. So John 20, picking up with verse 19, it says this. When it was evening on that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Now, I want to remind us here, like, they had taken Jesus and executed him, right? Like, in our, like, like let's, let's remember the context. The disciples scattered because they were afraid that the Jewish leaders were going to kill them as well because they had been conspiring for a really long time to stop this movement, whatever it was. And so you've got the disciples gathered together. The doors are locked because they're, they're terrified. 
It says, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side, so the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. But Thomas, called twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, If I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now, I want to take a moment here and kind of flesh this out because I honestly, poor Thomas, right? And, and I don't know, like, I got to imagine you've got 12 guys in Jesus who've spent three years hanging out together doing a lot of life together. I mean, here's some context for you. Parkside is almost three years old. So like you think about the time that some of us have spent together when you include like before we launched, like that's about the same amount of time that some of us have been doing life together. We've done a lot of life together. We've laughed together a lot, a lot of laughter. We've had some moments where we haven't seen eye to eye We've had some difficulties. We've had some challenges. We've celebrated. We've had some losses. We've grieved together. That's what these 13 people plus the other people who were following them that we don't even all know who they all were had done, right? So when you think about it from that context, you've got to believe that some of these guys were probably practical jokers. You know, like they like to pull pranks on one another. You guys have met Matt. One of his favorite hobbies is scaring Callie. It's just the reality, right? And if you want me to believe that these 12 teenage, adolescent, young adult men in Jesus didn't have some prank wars happening, I, you're crazy. Because I am fully confident that at some point, at least one of them went and found some sort of like snake or frog or something and put it in the other one's tent. And like, you know, like these things happened. And so when I look at this scripture and I see Thomas say, I don't believe you, I almost wonder if Thomas was like, guys, this is the meanest joke you've ever played on me. It's not funny. He's dead. They killed him. And now you're trying to play jokes and make me believe that he's alive again? That's mean. Now, I don't know this for sure. But I've got to imagine that somewhere within Thomas, he was like, this is this is not nice. They were all here together. I wasn't here. And now they're going to tell me that like he came and appeared to them. Really, guys? And so Thomas is like, I, got, I need to see it for myself. The rest of you, the other 10 of you, because remember, we're down to 11 now. The other 10 of you got to see him. I want to see him for myself. So here's what's really funny about this passage of Scripture. We go from verse 25 where where Thomas says, if I don't see it, I won't believe it. And the next verse, verse 26 says this. Watch this. A week later, a week later, his disciples were indoors again. And Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. And look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I don't know why I find it so funny that Jesus made Thomas wait a week. I don't know why he did that. But can you imagine being Thomas? And like, you still got the other 10 saying, we've seen him. And Thomas still has not seen the proof. A whole week he had to wait in that moment of doubt and not being sure and feeling like, I don't, maybe it caused tension between him and the other guys. We don't know. But I think sometimes when we read scripture, we pull the real life out of it and we just look at the words. And we have to remember that these are people 
with emotions and fears and feelings and experiences. And the man that they had followed for three years, the man that they had left everything for, left their livelihood for, they had quit their jobs with no promise of security to follow one man who said he was the the son of God. And the reality is, in the beginning, they didn't know that that was who he was saying he was. Jesus simply said, follow me. And they were like, okay. And three years they spent with him, and now he was gone. And then he's back, and Thomas is like, I don't believe it unless I see it. Which makes sense. And, and the, the truth is, like, I, I feel bad for Thomas because we have dubbed him Doubting Thomas, right? Like, that's what he gets called. Like, oh, there's the, here's the disciples, you know, Peter, James, John, blah, 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 Doubting Thomas. Like, the poor man. Like, can you imagine if you were known by the thing that, like, riddles you in life? I don't want to be known as anxious Deborah, thank you very much. Right? But the truth is, he wasn't the only one who doubted. He was not the only one who doubted. But he gets stuck with that label. In Luke chapter 24, there's, there's an interesting story about something that happens like that same day. So Jesus comes back from the dead. He, he has this conversation with Mary. She goes back and tells the disciples that she's seen him. And he hasn't seen the disciples yet, right? So Mary's the only, at this point in time, we're backing up a little bit. I'm giving you a piece of the story in between. Mary sees him. She goes and tells the disciples. They don't believe her. And then Jesus appears to a couple of guys who are a couple of of his followers, not the 12, but like people who had been his disciples. And they're walking to this place called Emmaus. And he comes alongside him and he just strikes up this conversation with him, but they don't recognize him. Scripture tells us that, that he made it so that they did not know who he was. And there's this moment where they're like, hey, come have dinner with us. Like we're going over to this place, like you just come hang out with us. He's like, okay, sounds good. And in Luke chapter 24, it says that he was reclining at the table with them and he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And in that moment, their eyes were open and they recognized him but then he disappeared from their sight. And then they said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us when he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? Like there was something familiar about this guy and it was, he was the Messiah. It says that very hour, he got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and those gathered together who said the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. So these two guys go to the 12, they're like, we've seen him. And they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he, he revealed who he was to them. And it's interesting because there's moments of doubt in all of the people who encounter him. It says that as they were saying these things, he himself stood in their midst, right? So Jesus appears to Mary, he appears to these two, and then he goes to the twelve or the 11, the 10. Thomas wasn't there. And here's what it says. He says to them, peace be to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Look at my hands and my feet, that it is myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see, I have. Having said this, he showed him his hands and feet, But they were still amazed and in disbelief because of their joy. And he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. Again, I love what Jesus does here. Because he knows they're like, okay, this can't be real. Like, like, what is happening? And they think they're seeing a ghost and Jesus is like, I got to prove to these. Like, Like, hey, I'm hungry. Do you have something that I can eat? and he eats this piece of of fish in front of them because ghosts don't eat, right? And Jesus is like, I'll prove it to you. And he does it so subtly. He's like, hey, you have something to eat? He doesn't even say, like, I'm not a ghost. He just says, like, feed me something, and then you'll know. You'll know that it's me. 
that I'm alive. There's another verse, there's another section of this story post the resurrection where Jesus is getting ready to send them out and he's getting ready to go back to the Father in heaven. And in Matthew 28, it says this in verses 16 and 17. It says, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. There's a couple of running themes through these pieces of scripture this morning. And one of them is this doubt, this disbelief. And the truth is, it's perfectly okay to ask questions. Like, that's our human nature. The disciples asked a lot of questions during their three years with Jesus. And I think that somewhere along the way, the church has led people to believe that it's not okay to ask questions. And the church has become an unsafe place to ask questions. When it really should be the safest place to ask questions. And so asking questions is not the problem here. Having moments of uncertainty is not the problem here. But I do believe that there is a difference between not being sure having questions, and living in doubt. And I think Jesus calls us out of living in doubt. And that is what we see him doing after the resurrection. He did not go straight back to the Father and not return. Like he wanted them to see and know and understand because they needed to be sure. He needed them to be sure of who he was. And it's something that Jesus addresses several times with his disciples. And what I want to do is I want to look at how Jesus responded to that. Because he doesn't get angry and he doesn't lose patience when they're not sure. But he does address it. And I think it's really important that we look at some of those moments that he himself addresses in Scripture. One of those is in Matthew chapter 6. We're very familiar with this passage. This is the one that I don't know what your Bible says, but in my Bible it says the heading is the cure for anxiety. I love it. I love it. I love it. Like, like, I don't know what to do about my anxiety. Here you go. <laughs> like, read this. And then, like, that's the first step. Like, that, like, I'm not saying, like, everything is perfect, but, like, that's where we start. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's telling them not to worry. He says, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or your body about what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't they worth more? Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus gives us this story, or that we get this story of, of Jesus being on a boat <laughs> with the disciples, right? Like they're on a boat. The storm comes up. The waves are just horrific. And Jesus is asleep. Like, right? Like, we're, most of us are familiar with this story, too. Like, Jesus is taking a nap. Like, the, which the man's exhausted. He's been healing and casting out demons and helping people. Like, he is bone weary. And Jesus is taking a nap. This storm is happening. And the disciples are freaking out. And so they go and they wake him up. And they're like, you've got to save us. We're going to die. And Jesus doesn't say anything to the storm yet. He just gets up and he says to them in verse 26, why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And then in Matthew chapter 14, there's another one. This is the one where Jesus comes to them in the morning. They're in the boat, but he was going to meet up with them, and he comes walking on the water. 
It says, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. I don't I have questions about how often they saw ghosts back in, like, New Testament. <laughs> like, apparently it was common because they're like, it's a ghost. Like, you see these often? And they cried out in fear. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them, have courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And of course, Peter says, if it's you, then tell me to come out there to to the water and come to you. And and so Jesus was like, okay, come on. And so Peter climbs out of the boat, he starts walking on the water. He sees the wind and the waves and he realizes what he's done. I think Peter had a bad habit of like getting ahead of himself, like he would act before he thought. And so it says he saw the strength of the wind and he was afraid and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? These three pieces of scripture, these three stories that we get in the gospel of Matthew use this specific phrase, you of little faith. But the other thing that's interesting is that it's, also accompanied by the same mental state for these people, right? In Matthew 6, it says, he's talking about worry. Don't worry. Why would you worry, you of little faith? And in the two instances on the sea, where they're in the boat and the storm is happening, and then with Peter walking on water, it says they were afraid. There was fear. And Jesus accompanies that with you of little faith. So I got to thinking about this because it's interesting, this connection here. And what I realized in my own life is that fear and worry and anxiety lead to doubt in my life. When I'm worried about things, when I'm worried about how bills are going to get paid or when I'm worried about someone's health or when I'm worried about what the future looks like, I'm not in the moment where I am trusting that God is in control. When I'm anxious or afraid, I'm so focused on what is happening that I can't focus on the fact that God has everything under control. That link between fear and worry and anxiety and doubt, this idea of little faith, But it's also tied to this idea of a lack of trust. What Jesus says to Thomas is he encourages him to not be faithless. He says, don't be faithless, but believe. And that phrase little faith in the Greek is this really fun Greek word called, it's not called, this fun Greek word that is oligopistos. Isn't that fun? Oligopistos. The only reason I can pronounce these well is because there's a a feature on blueletterbible.com where you hit this little microphone and it pronounces it for you. So please don't be impressed. I just like typed it out phonetically so that I could say it right. But this, this Greek term oligopistos is this is this idea of little faith but what it means is this lacking in confidence lacking in confidence in who Christ is and who he says he is this trusting too little and as I'm trying to write this sermon I'm like I am really being convicted here Because how many times in my life has this been true for me? Is this true for me? I'm currently in a season where I'm working through some things and I'm having to continually remind myself, like, trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. I don't have to worry. I can have confidence in who he is. And I, I think we need to remember that Jesus knew what was going to happen next with this group of men, with this group of people. That, And we're gonna head into that next week a little bit more, but they were about to be sent out all over the world and they were going to need faith. They were going to have to be confident in who they were about to tell people that the Messiah was. They were going to have to have trust in him. 
because they were going to have to believe that the gospel was true and that everything had changed. Because what they're getting ready to go tell people is undoing hundreds of years of obedience to the law. At least that was how those people were going to see it. And what I love so much about how Jesus addresses their doubt, He has so much patience with them. He tells them in Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, you don't have to worry about what you wear. If God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? When the storm is raging, And they think they're going to die. He gets up and he rebukes the winds and the sea. And in Matthew chapter 14, when Peter is walking on water and panics and starts to sink, Jesus doesn't hesitate. It says immediately he reached out his hand and caught hold of Peter. Jesus protects and he provides even when our faith is little. But he does call us to a deeper faith. And I think this is where we can loop back around to Thomas specifically in those days after the resurrection. And Thomas is waiting. Can can you imagine like trying to sleep in that week. Like Thomas does not know what we know, right? Like Thomas gets verse 25 and then immediately we get verse 26, but there's a week in between verse 25 and 26 for Thomas. And the uncertainty is churning. The doubt is churning. The grief. I don't know how well Thomas might have slept that week, wondering why didn't he appear to me as well? Why did he come? He knows everything. He knew I wasn't here. Why did he wait? Why why couldn't he wait for me? And what Jesus says to him is don't be faithless any longer. Don't be uncertain any longer. You don't have to doubt any longer. And when Thomas sees it, he believes. But because Jesus is who he is, he doesn't leave it there. What he does next with Thomas all that long time ago is for us. Because watch this. In verse 29, Jesus says, Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's us. He is talking about us because we don't see him with our eyes. We don't get to put our our fingers on his hands and see that scar. We don't get to see the side. But what Jesus did after Easter, after the resurrection, was left a legacy for us so that we could have a testimony of people who saw and believed. And this is where it gets hard for us because this is where we have to have faith. We don't get to see with our own eyes, but we have an entire history of confirmation that Jesus is who he says he is. And there have been people and there were people who had tried to disprove this since that time. One of my favorite books is a book that was written by a a man who was going to set out to prove that Jesus was not real. He did not live. That the, the crucifixion might have happened, but he never rose from the dead. I mean, did intense research on the physical aspects of this. Did research on the historical aspects of this. And he was going to write a book 
that disproved all of Christianity. The funny thing is, he ended up writing a book that affirms everything that this book says. It's a book called The Case for Christ by a man named Lee Strobel. Because in the midst of writing that book, he realized, oh my word, this is true. The good news, the gospel is true. Who Jesus is, is true. Converted him to Christianity as he was trying to disprove the whole thing. That's the kindness of God to us. Is that even when we have little faith, even when we doubt, we may not even believe at all, and he is patient, and he is kind, and he reminds us again and again of who he is. He doesn't give up on us. Jesus didn't let Peter drown because he had little faith. He reached out immediately and helped him back up, but he called him out on it, and he said, why did you doubt? You know who I am. You were walking on water, dude. Like, what? You were doing it. And then you had this this doubt crept in. This little faith took over. And I think what Jesus wants for us is to just live in this space where we say, our circumstances are going to be hard sometimes. I wish that wasn't true. But you can trust that I am who I say I am. You can be certain that I am the Messiah. Because what he did in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, and the days after that remind us Everything is different for us now. That we can live in true freedom and we can have faith in the God who is alive. Who protects and provides, but pushes us ever so gently to a deeper faith. One of my favorite stories in scripture is in Mark chapter 9. And I love it so much because it, is, it has been a story that has stuck with me in seasons where I have really struggled. And, and I, this section of scripture has, in my Bible, has notes all over. And I went back to this story many, many, many times. And there's many times that I've actually prayed pieces of this scripture. There's a story about Jesus has gone up to a mountain It's it's the moment of transfiguration, and and you can go back and read it later if you want to in the beginning of Mark chapter 9. But he comes back down off the mountain, and he meets up with his disciples, and there's a crowd gathered there. And this man says to him, I brought my son to you. Like He has this this spirit. He has this this demon that makes him unable to speak, and it, it causes him to have seizures, and it throws him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and he grinds his teeth. Like it's, it's, it's horrible. And I, and I asked your disciples if they could drive it out, but they couldn't. And so Jesus replies to them, you unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? And he says, bring this man to me. Now I want to say here, like it sounds like Jesus is fussing at them. And, and I don't know the tone. I don't. And, and maybe he was rebuking them in a sense. That's okay. It's okay. But I think his heart was, I've shown you you can trust me. I've shown you that I am who I've said I am. And yet I still see doubt in you. Because if you didn't doubt, you would be living differently. And so Jesus looks at this man and his son, and he He said, the the father says to Jesus, if you can do anything, if you can do anything, just have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus' response to that father is, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. 
And I love this because it seems to counterbalance, right? He's like, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I think it's this heart of like, I, I do, but I know that doubt is still going to come up. And I need you to help when I don't believe. I believe, but help my unbelief. And I can't tell you how many times in my own life I have cried out to God, God, I believe you, but I also need you to help my unbelief because I'm struggling. You know what Jesus did? He cast out the demon. He heals that young man. And that father and son go on their way. And everything is different. And that is what he does for us. Every single moment of every day. And it's okay if you have moments where you have to look at him and say, I do believe, but help my unbelief. As we finish up our time together this morning, that's the question I want to leave you with. Is that where in your life do you need the Lord to help you with your unbelief? We know that that the good news of Jesus changed everything, and it does change everything. It should change everything for us. It should change how we live our lives. But that doesn't mean we don't have moments where we wrestle with uncertainty. We can wrestle with the uncertainty, but we don't have to live in doubt. I believe. God, help my unbelief. And he will, and he does. And what an incredible kindness that is. That that is the God that we serve. We're so glad that you chose to join us here today. And hey, before you take off, I just want to ask you a quick question. How were you changed by today's message? Take a little bit of time to reflect on that and what it is that God might have for you through what you heard here today. Uh, even if it's something so, so small that it, it just changes a little bit about how you're thinking, how you're processing, that can be massive. And it helps us to live and love like Jesus just a little bit more in everything that we do. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.